Great, I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation. Uh, I'm gonna kick off the ventral hernia segment uh, of this show. I have a couple of disclosures, none of that which should be relevant uh, to this talk. And so when I got the topic of have we really made a difference in recurrence rates, I really started to think about, well, in which type of repair, right? We had a great seg a segment on inguinal repair and all the different repairs that come along with the inguinal region. I think we even have more options in the ventral hernia arena. And so there's kind of a word soup that comes into my mind when I think of recurrence and ventral hernia and, and, and which repair do you mean, right? And so then I think the, the simplest way to think of this so let's go back to the beginning and think about sutured mesh repairs. How often does just a sutured ventral hernia mesh uh, repair uh, recur? And so there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, I pulled a few of the, the better studies. This is a study from 1986. It was a 12 year retrospective review that reported uh, around a 46% uh, percent recurrence rate uh, utilizing suture repair. And the majority of those recurrences happened within six months. I would say that that's not probably an unreasonable uh, estimation of the problem. This is some more data. What about when do uh, recurrences occur and, uh, and uh, what is the rate uh, over time, right? And so in this study, there was a pretty good number of patients, not a huge population-based uh, data look, but a 10-year, uh, looked at 10-year cumulative risks and then now we're adding mesh into the equation, right? And so we, we talked a lot about mesh in inguinal hernias this morning. What about mesh in the anterior abdominal wall? Well, here you can see that mesh reduced the recurrence rates uh, by about uh, two times. So there was uh, about 60% uh, or 60% or of patients utilizing mesh did not have recurrences out to 10 years, whereas only 40% uh, of the patients uh, were recurrence free with uh, mesh repairs. And then this study, uh, this is one of the bigger population-based studies that really looks at when do hernias recur and how do they recur after each time we go back and fix the hernias, first time, second time, third time. Uh, and this study used population-based statistics based on reoperation to, uh, to, to represent recurrence of the hernias. And here you can see one of the main findings was that you're much more likely uh, to get uh, a hernia, a, a five-year uh, need for reoperation after each hernia repair. And I think that, that makes a lot of sense to all of us. We know that hernias get harder the more that uh, you have to do them. But what about mesh, really? In this study, uh, 10,000 patients looking at uh, uh, reoperative rates for ventral hernia, not only single-time ventral hernias, but second and third-time ventral hernias, mesh didn't make a difference. What about laparoscopy? And so this study also looked at time periods to kind of look at uh, what the laparoscopic area, era had done to recurrence rates. And really there was the pre-19, uh, uh, the pre, pre and post-1995 cohorts and there wasn't really any difference in the laparoscopic age versus the minimally invasive age. But how can we make our laparoscopic repairs better? We all talk about, do you need suture fixation? Uh, can you use just tacks? Do you need absorbable tacks? What if now you just suture around the mesh? There's all kinds of ways to put meshes in. This is probably the most well-known study uh, with Dr. Hennifer and Dr. Cobb looked at tacks versus transvascular sutures, uh, a modest follow-up of about 12 months, and they saw that there was less recurrence in the transvascular suture fixation group by about a half. This is a more recent study, 2018, looked at a meta-analysis comparing uh, various mech, uh, mesh fixation techniques. Uh, there was a little bit of a, a, a favoring uh, towards suture placement. Uh, and then a further meta-analysis looking at uh, things like fiber and glue, sutures, absorbable tacks, found that, that the only thing that looked a little bit different was the absorbable tacks showed a higher uh, recurrence risk with a relative risk of about 1.37. Well, what about the more common uh, abdominal re wall reconstructive techniques? Those things that we've been looking at over the past eight years, we, we come to the meetings and everybody debates, you know, you gotta put the mesh behind the muscles, you gotta do posterior component separation. Some people are zealots for anterior approaches. Well, is there a difference if you're doing component separation, you're doing posterior techniques versus anterior techniques? Not a lot of long-term data out there. This is one study by Kerpata looked at open anterior component separation versus posterior component separation. Uh, 
The comparison in this group is really difficult though because in the anterior group, uh, the wounds were more contaminated and they used biologic meshes 84% uh, of the time. The posterior component separations used biologic meshes only about a quarter percent of the time. The wounds were less dirty. Um, but the, the end all result of the study was that there was uh, a greater wound comp complication rate in anterior component separation. I think most of us would, would agree with that. Uh, but the recurrence rate was markedly higher in anterior uh, versus posterior component separation. I think if you look at wounds that are contaminated and things get infected afterwards, we would expect those, those wounds to, to be uh, more recurrent. Well, what about this though? This was published in 2018, a little bit newer study looked at open anterior component separation versus TAR. Uh, this was a, more of a meta-analysis and had 281 cases in it. Uh, again, the open anterior component separation had a higher rate of wound, contamin uh, a higher rate of wound contamination or problems, uh, post-operative wound problems. The recurrence rates uh, for the posterior component separation had fallen to around 6% though, which was much better than anything that we've talked about. Whereas the uh, open anterior component separation was about 9.5. The follow-up was a little bit lacking in both of, uh, in this overall meta-analysis. Um, and again, the statistical, uh, there was not a statistical difference reached for open versus posterior co component separation. So I don't know that we have great data or great population-based studies to say where exactly we are in recurrence rates. When I talk with my fellows, we're putting this talk together, and they ask, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, I don't know. We, we, we had to have gotten a little bit better. Um, but it's hard to say uh, that, that we've, we've dramatically increased recurrence rates. I think mesh is probably the most significant factor when you look at, it, at all of the stuff. But one thing that we do know and that, that I think we have gotten a lot better at over the last decade is uh, in the concept of things like ERAS and, and prehabilitation, all right? And so to set up the rest of the, uh, this session in the talks, I'm gonna talk a little bit about preparing your patients for the OR, and I think that we can, we can help our patients uh, most significantly starting in the clinic. And one of the reasons I think that the recurrence rates and the, the wound morbidity rates and the things that we see in ventral hernia are so across the board is that, as you all know, ventral hernias are all very different, right? So you can have that top picture there that's got a chronically infected piece of biologic and a massive defect, or you can have a small umbilical hernia in a patient that's obese, and those patients are gonna have markedly different outcomes just from uh, w whatever you do. And so I think that's where the difficulty comes in figuring out. I'm a big fan of algorithms in my center, and so, so we have algorithms kind of for everything. One of my favorite algorithms is a patient comes in with just terrible inguinodynia, I send them from San Diego to LA and Dr. Chen. But in the ventral hernia world, uh, uh, we, we always have, in, in a more chronic ventral hernia, we have opportunity for optimization of these patients. If you've got an acute or strangulated hernia, you don't have that option. Or if you've got someone that's gotta go to the OR, we go to the OR. But I think if, you, if you've got the luxury to prepare people for the OR, you probably should. And so I think there are several comorbidities that we have the opportunity to optimize in the clinic, especially when we start talking about abdominal wall reconstruction. BMI. We all know that obesity predisposes to incisional hernia, and this can be for several reasons. One, suboptimal fascial exposure, suboptimal wound healing, increased rates of wound infection, increased intra-abdominal uh, pressure leading to tissue ischemia on our closures. Sauer did a nice study that looked at BMI and odds ratio of recurrence of uh, ventral hernias and found that the odds ratio was about 1.10 for each body mass point over 25 uh, in the ventral uh, hernia patient. NIH criteria for those of you that don't do uh, bariatric surgery are 35 or greater uh, in the presence of obesity-related comorbidities or 40 or greater without comorbidity requirement. I'm a, I do bariatric surgery as well. I think a sleeve is probably the best thing for most of our more complex ventral hernia patients. You just, it, it's a little bit simpler to get up uh, towards the hiatus. Usually it's an unmolested area. The results are, are fairly similar. If you've got a rich patient with a ter terrible hernia and you can't get to the stomach, you might be able to try one of the newer intragastric therapies. The problem is that none of these are covered by insurance, though they would be the perfect approach for a patient with a terrible uh, hernia to get them down a few pounds, it's, just, it's hard to get them covered. Smoking, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I'm pretty strict about smoking in the ventral hernia of a patient. Uh, uh, we all know that smoking causes several problems, uh, foremost of which is hypoxia. Um, 
and cellular dysfunction. This is a picture of anterior component separation that was done in the VA uh, near us uh, uh, that, uh, in a smoker. And that's exactly what you don't want to see. The plastic surgeons have been all over this literature for a long time. And they found that the odds ratio of delayed wound healing was about 2.31 in their cosmetic patients. And then when they say bariatric patients, the odds ratio went up to 3.3. They're not doing gastric bypasses and sleeve gastrectomy. That's when they're doing these resections of the big panaces, kind of like what we're doing when we're doing big, huge ventral hernia repairs. I do nicotine test. I tell my patients I want them off for the, the time that you can get out of them. If you can get them off smoking for about four weeks beforehand, you'll, you'll negate the wound healing effects. The pulmonary effects get better after a couple months. I always try to con, uh, convince them that this doesn't have to be a permanent change. You may not get them to permanently quit smoking, but if you can advocate for a pause, sometimes you get a little bit more buy-in than that. I think diabetes optimization is important. You can use all kinds of different uh, society's recommendations, whether it's the ADA or the a a ACE. I use eight because I, my, my secretaries can remember for their hemoglobin A1C, I just say greater than eight, no date, and then everybody remembers, and then we get them back in the clinic. I don't know if that's strict enough, but what about your patients undergoing abdominal wall reconstruction uh, that aren't diabetic? And so this was a really neat study that looked at outcomes or adverse events in patients with and without diabetes relative to postoperative hyperglycemia. And so if you had hyperglycemia with a glucose greater than 180 and even a non-diabetic infection, you had three times the risk of composite infections, reoperative interventions, and in-hospital deaths. So I think it's upon us to, in these bigger operations, to check our blood sugars pretty religiously. COBD, we all know COBD is an enemy, right? You see that patient that's in the clinic and can't breathe, they're not gonna do well from surgery, right? But the thing that we're always thinking about is respiratory complications and, and prolonged intubation. Well, patients with COBD are also at a more uh, a severe risk for postoperative sepsis uh, and infections. Here you can look at ventral hernia repair uh, at the bottom of the slide, I know it's kind of a busy slide. You can see that specific postoperative complications, patients with COPD are, are more uh, are significantly at risk for pneumonias, reintubations, and septic shock. So I think preoperative optimization in that accord is, is really important. There's all the little things that we do, and I, you know, everyone does uh, this stuff. We do the right thing to remove the, the, the hair. We maintain uh, good interoperative uh, temperature control. I give antibiotics when I use mesh. I don't do antibiotic irrigation, though I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that do. I really don't use any wound barriers. What about DVT? For my big ab wall reconstructions, I, I, I treat these like major abdominal uh, surgery cases and they get VTE prophylaxis both preoperatively uh, and in the postoperative period. And the last thing that I think is really important, uh, especially in the, in the inguinal re arena, the ventral arena, I think the better uh, relationship you can establish with the patient and the better they understand the prosthetics that you're gonna use to them, perhaps the least likely they will be to attack you in the post-operative period. Now that's not 100% true, right? We're gonna run across some, some patients that just are gonna have bad things happen and they're not, gonna, they're not gonna understand what you had told them beforehand. But I think uh, trying your hardest to establish that relationship is important. And so every one of my patients, uh, you know, this patient comes in, they've got a massive abdominal defect, and I tell them, well, I want you to lose some weight. And they're like, well, I didn't come here because I was fat, I came here because I had a hernia. Uh, and, and so, and I start with telling them, well, the, the, the four guys that tried to fix it before you were, you know, I, I'm sure they were terrible, but, 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 they, but maybe not. And so then I try to give them the brief anatomy lesson and I say, you know, can you move this over here to this over there? Would this, would this work? And they're like, I don't think that's going to fit. And then you, you try to tell them, well, what could you get rid of? What color? And then, and then you can get the light bulb to go off sometimes, yeah. you know, right? I mean, it's pretty <laughs> They said, and you're like, yes, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And so I think preoperative education, and you know, we all get CT maps for planning. I think you can maybe get a little bit more buy-in if you do that. So in conclusion, uh, I'm not sure where we're at with recurrence rates. I think they're getting better, uh, but it, it's really hard uh, to figure that out, especially when we look at 10 different repairs and all different types of hernias. I think aggressive identify, uh, identification of the, pro the problems that occur start in the clinic. Uh, 
we really want to optimize things before we, we, we undertake these really complicated operations. It's critical that you develop great relationships with your patients. And you also perform, you inform them all the potential problems that can happen because we do know what those problems are. And we, we have a pretty good idea of what the risks of those problems are. And again, uh, I think optimal outcomes start in the clinic. So thank you.